continuing in our series right now called When Jesus Heals, and this is our third message in that series out of Luke chapter 4. Uh, and today I'm going to actually jump to the fourth statement and skip the third, and that'll make sense when I come back to it next week. But in Luke 4, 18, Jesus is standing in the synagogue, and he says, part of what I'm here to do is to set free those who are oppressed those who are oppressed. So last week, we talked about those who are captive or those who are prisoners. We talked about their freedom has been removed by an enemy. So what we were talking about was demon possession uh, and that the believer cannot be possessed in the way of ownership, but can be oppressed. And so we talked about how Jesus delivers from that oppression. But today we're going to be looking at how he says that he's going to set free those who are oppressed. In Luke 14, 4, 18, it says to set free those who are oppressed, but it's different from the captive because of the word that he's using. In the Greek, the word is throw out, throw out, and it means to break or to shatter into pieces. So if I go back and read that statement, Jesus says, I have come to set free those who have been broken and shattered into pieces. We've already read in this set of scriptures that he's going to bring the gospel or the good news to, to heal the terminal illness. He's going to revive and regenerate your spirit so that you can live eternally with God. We also know that he's going to bring deliverance because of these demonic attacks that come on us. And now we're going to learn that he's going to bring healing to your shattered pieces. So let's just be realistic. Where do we get shattered at? We don't get shattered physically. Yes, you can have diseases or illnesses, but when you talk about being broken into pieces, we're talking about emotionally. We're talking about what it means to be broken inside. You can even talk to someone else and say, man, that just shattered me. I just feel broken inside. I'm hurt. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. So today I want to start a trend by addressing a concern that has come up about this type of healing that Jesus does. I know that in Isaiah 53, 4, it says this about the Savior who is to come, who will die for us. It says, surely he bore himself our grief and our sorrows he carried. So as a baseline premise, we know this from the book of Isaiah, that somehow Jesus took upon himself. He bore our griefs and sorrows. Those places inside of us that are burdened, we know he bore that. But some people are saying, but we're a new creation in Christ. Why do I need to deal with my past? Why don't I just believe my identity? In other words, they're saying, since you have a new identity, why are you going back into your old life and digging those things up? They really, what they're saying is, why don't you just put your big boy pants on and let that stuff of the past remain in the past? Let it go. Just move on. There are conversations right now in the church about whether Christians should go back and look at the hurts and the pains of their past. And in that, a lot of the argument is where there's some abuses going on when it comes to digging up things in your past. And let me just say as a baseline so you hear me, there are abuses in everything in Christianity. They're just are. The enemy creates a problem out of everything of God for us to deal with. We know in church today there are abuses of authority. We know there are abuses in how money is being used. We know there are abuses in doctrine. There's always something the enemy's going to try to come in and mess up. So when it comes to this going back into our past to be healed from a past pain, are there stories of abuses in that situation? Yeah. And are there stories of great successes? many. And so we got to look at this thing scripturally and say, are we supposed to be doing this or not? Because today I want to show you that even Jesus recognized pains of the past have to be brought up and dealt with. Even Jesus exercised this mentality of, we need some healing prayer with you. There's some things in your past that you're hurting from that I want to help you with. And so the words that we use in church today to describe this process are things like inner healing. 
You might hear the word theophostic prayer. You might hear the word healing prayer. What all of these things really mean is, let's see if something from your past is still negatively affecting you today. And if it's there, what are we going to do about it? Uh, Things like, you say, I have trouble trusting men. And we realize that in your past, your father was a drunk and you watched him beat your mother. You might say, I can never be happy in a marriage. And then we find out that you were raped when you were younger repeatedly, and now sex is a dirty thing for you, and you just can't deal with it inside of the context of marriage. Or maybe you say, I battle with my self-worth, and I have these fits of anger and rage. And then we find out that your parents were perfectionist, and nothing you did was ever acceptable to them. And you're carrying around this rage and you don't know what to do with it. And it's been since you've come to Christ. So what do we do? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to step into the Bible and I'm going to say, Jesus, how do you heal this? What do you do with this? And as is my custom, I'm going to start in the Old Testament. And we'll come to the New Testament in a bit. So let's go back to the Old Testament. Open up Psalms 51. Psalms chapter 51. You're going to see that David understood that he needed the Lord to deal with his past pain. In Psalms 51 uh, verse 1, it says, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Watch, blot out my transgression, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. David has identified three things that he wants dealt with. First, the sin. Sin is what the law defines, what is sinful in the eyes of God. That's why we have the law as a tutor, to teach us what is sinful to God. That's why the law must never go away, because we must always understand what God considers sin. Then there's a transgression. What is a transgression? Take the word apart. It's crossing over aggressively. I have transgressed. In other words, I have chosen the sin. I am choosing to walk forward in something that I know to be sinful. Iniquity. What is iniquity? Iniquity is the core. It's what's in me that's evil. It's what's driving those decisions to transgress. And David is saying, I want the sin out. I want the transgression out. And I want the iniquity out. David just lays it out on the table and says, I want you to deal with me in these three areas. Verse 3. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Here's what David is saying. I think about this stuff. I know there's problems. It doesn't leave my mind. I remember the things that I've done wrong. Verse 4. Against you, you only, I have sinned, watch past tense, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and you are blameless when you judge. Here's what he just said. I know you know what I did. I know you know what I did. And you're justified when you say that I have sin, when I have transgression, and when I have iniquity. And notice that David is talking about the things that he has done. I have sinned. Verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. He's recognizing his human condition that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Born into a sinful world. Verse 6. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being and in the hidden part, you will make known wisdom. Did you see it? It was right there. Boom. David just said, God, you want truth in my innermost being where there is not truth there. You desire truth in my innermost being and in the hidden part, the hidden part of me in my soul, you will make known wisdom. Where my sin is hidden, you want to bring wisdom to that place. God wants to reveal something that's in a hidden part of you because we all have strongholds hiding in our belief system. That's a shameless book plug right there. We have a book in the lobby. 
called Hide and Seek. And it talks about the lies that are hiding in our belief system. And when God exposes truth and wisdom to those things, we get set free to walk in freedom moving forward. Uh, but there, this is where we need Jesus to bring truth into past offenses. This is where guilt and shame and bitterness and regret and hurt is going to be addressed. Listen, it's in there. It's in there because of something I did. I did that because of something that's driving me. I have a core iniquity. I have a pain from my past. It's causing me a transgression, but he wants to bring a truth and a wisdom. This is the place where Jesus will explain why we did what we did. It's the place where Jesus will explain where was he when that happened. It's the place where Jesus will explain how he forgives the situation and what happens. It's the place where Jesus will explain how to move forward in light of what happened. This is straight up. David is talking about, I need healing in my soul. There is stuff going on here that needs to be addressed. In verse 7, purify me with hyssop and I'll be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. David is desiring that cleansing. And this is what he's saying. I cannot do it on my own. I cannot just say, I'm going to forget all that. I'm good. I'm going to move forward. I need you to bring some wisdom into this because I'm trying to process through it and I can't seem to get there and I'm still struggling and it still makes me cry when I think about it and I still get angry when I remember that. And all of a sudden, I need you to come in and wash me, cleanse me, get this thing straightened up in me, make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. What? David is saying, I want to rejoice because you broke some of my bones. That's, that's kind of counterproductive there for some reason to me. How do we get joy and gladness from broken bones? What he's saying is there's a stronghold in me that you're going to break. What he's saying is that there's a shame, there's a guilt, there's a regret, and you're going to come in and you're going to break that thing. And when you break that thing, I'm going to rejoice that I'm no longer in bondage to it. So come and break my bones. Come and destroy those things that don't need to be in place. Let me have some freedom from that. Verse 9. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart. I don't have a clean heart. I want you to create it in me, oh God. Watch this next statement. And renew a steadfast spirit in me. Please don't forget this word, renew. You cannot renew something unless it was new once. Something made it no longer new, and he's saying, can you put it back like it was? Because of the way my father treated me, I am no longer who I was, but I want that innocence back again. Can you renew that in me? Bring me back to that place. My past sin and transgressions and iniquities get removed. There's a clean heart as a result. We get renewed when our mind is let go of the pains and the sins of the past. So let's be honest. This is what most of us do as believers. We go out into our front yards and we mow the yard and we say, doesn't it look beautiful? Most men will go in and get their wives and say, look at that yard. Look at that yard. The edging is done. The grass is flat. It's absolutely beautiful. But what we haven't told her is that we didn't pull the weeds out first. So right now it looks good. But as life goes on, those weeds are going to pop up again. And they're going to outshine that grass. And you're going to be looking at that yard saying, this is not attractive at all. Why? Because it looked good for a while. But I knew the weeds were there. I knew they haven't been pulled up. And if they don't get pulled up, we'll never have a lasting beauty in that yard. So we know that David understood that there was a cleanup to do with his past, his guilt, his shame, his sin, his transgression, his iniquity. But once Jesus comes and dies for us, are we not a new creation? Aren't all things that are old passed away and all things? I think I read that in scripture somewhere. Matter of fact, I think it's in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things passed away, 
behold, new things have come. So my past is gone. All things are gone. I don't have to deal with that. Matter of fact, Philippians 3, Paul says it this way. Brethren, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, I forget what lies behind me. And I reach forward to what lies ahead. And I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call in Jesus Christ. So that's it, Christian. That's it, believer. We just got to forget that stuff. Anybody having any luck with forgetting that stuff? Maybe he's not talking about that stuff. Maybe he's talking about I'm a new creation because I have an alive spirit working in me now that the Holy Spirit dwells in, and it's a whole new ball game from that point forward. And maybe he's talking about I do have past hurts, but maybe I've got to deal with them so that they can be gone because I don't know about you, but when I came to Christ, all of the hurts of my past, I didn't forget them. They were still there. And you can ask my wife, you can ask my daughter, you can ask my closest friends. They're still affecting me today. I'm still making decisions based on a hurt that I had in my past. And just so you know, I've spent the last 22 weeks with chemo. (laughs) Dealing with this stuff, man. Got to get it cleaned up. So are you some kind of sub-Christian if you can't forget the past and move forward? Is that how we got to label us as the victims that can't seem to let it go? I don't know about you, but it's still there. And it still brings out an emotion of pain into me, and it still drives decisions I'm making today. And Jesus recognized that when you get hurt, you need healing. Not only physically, but when you get emotionally stepped on, when you get emotionally bruised, there needs to be a healing brought to that process. And I want to show you examples in the Bible, listen to me, where Jesus conducted healing prayer. I'll get a couple emails, but I'll deal with it. Don't worry about it. And I want you to know that every example I'm giving you is after Jesus is resurrected from the dead. So anybody who is a follower of him is now a new creation in Christ. We're dealing with the same status you and I have And yet he's going to these people and he's going to talk about a past pain. I'm going to show you one that you have thought of in one direction because it's always been taught that direction. But I want to show you what I think is actually going on. We're going to talk about Thomas. We're going to talk about Thomas. And there's something you need to know about Thomas because Thomas has this nickname. And the nickname is Doubting Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. And I've never really grabbed a hold of that definition. And Christ did say you were unbelieving and maybe now you need to believe. But the question is, was he a doubter? Did he doubt that Christ was raised from the dead? If you look in John 11, verse 7, it says, Then after this, Jesus said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, These Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you want to go there again? Then you go down to verse 16. Therefore Thomas, who is called Didymus, said to the fellow disciples, let us also go that we can die with him. Now, I don't know about you, but that's my first indication. This guy's not a doubter because he just said, if you're going to go back there and they're going to kill you, I'm going with you. Let's just go down there and get it over with and let him kill us because we're with this guy 100%. Yet after Jesus is resurrected, this is what happens in John 20, 25. So the other disciples were saying to him, hey, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands and the imprints of the nails and put my finger in the place of the nails and put my hand inside, I'm not going to believe you. And after days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them and Jesus came the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. And I want to tell you what's about to happen. The scripture says that Jesus clearly told them he was going to be crucified. Thomas knew he was going to be crucified. Thomas said, I will go down to Judea with you, and when they crucify you, I'll let them crucify me too. And then Jesus gets crucified. Where is Thomas in his head? I cannot believe this. He said it would happen, and it's happened, and I don't know what to do. I don't think he's doubting Thomas. I think he's discouraged Thomas. He thought he was going to be the king. He thought he was going to step up in Jerusalem and take over and bring peace to the land. And he was the Messiah. And now he's dead. And Thomas is just like, man, I I have been in this for three years. I've been walking it. I was with him. I was all the way. But they killed him, dude. 
What is there left to do? He's dead. And Jesus said to Thomas, reach here with your finger. See my hands? Reach here with your hand and put it to my side. Don't be unbelieving. Be believing. Thomas answered and said, my Lord and my God, I had it wrong all the time. You were going to be resurrected. You're a spiritual, eternal king. I get this now. And so the point I'm I'm having to bring to you is whether you believe he was doubting or whether you understand it like I do, he was incredibly discouraged. Jesus took the time to say, come here. We got to fix something in you. That pain, that doubt, that discouragement, that thing that's going on in you, I want you to come here and I want you to tangibly touch me and see I'm here. What did it do to Thomas? Man, he went on to be an evangelist. This guy went out and shared the gospel from that point forward. He knew what was going on. So I think what Jesus was doing was saying, I know that hurt when I died on the cross. And I know you got confused and you didn't know what to do and you were discouraged. But I'm going to build you right back up in a moment. There's another guy in the Bible that you know this story very clearly. But I want you to see it in the light of what happened. A man named Peter. We know Peter, right? We know Peter that sometimes says the dumbest things and gets slapped for it. But in the last moments of Jesus' life on earth, Peter's with him, but can't stay with him. He begins the arrest process, and Jesus tells him, buddy, you're going to deny me three times. And sure enough, man, he's in the courtyard, in the garden, and they're asking him, do you know this Jesus? We saw you with this Jesus. You even talk like this Jesus. And three times Peter says, no, it's not me. Stop asking me that. He began cursing, don't forget that, cursing, not saying curse words. He was speaking out a curse. I don't know him. Jesus gets crucified. And Peter has an immense hurt. The Bible says that he wept bitterly. If you've ever wept bitterly, you know the feelings associated with that, that I have collapsed on the inside. There is nothing left of me. It just got crushed. I got shattered, and I am weeping over what just happened. I just denied Jesus. Do you know that after the crucifixion, Peter goes back to fishing? He goes back to the Sea of Galilee and he begins fishing again. He didn't know what to do. It's over, buddy. I spent three years with him. I thought it was the Messiah. It was all good. But when it came down, when the rubber hit the road, I failed. I failed. I might as well go back and just fish because I don't even know what to do at this point. So he's out fishing one morning. He sees this guy on the shore. And what do you know? It's Jesus. Jesus is on the shore. Jesus is resurrected. Peter jumps out of the boat and swims to the shore, and he has a conversation with Jesus. Please don't forget what happened at the trial, what happened at the arrest. Don't forget the denial and how it crushed Peter, and watch Jesus speak to him. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these I said, yeah, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, well, tend my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? I don't know if you can feel it, but I can feel Jesus saying, I want to hear you say it out loud. Yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. He said, then shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Look at what just happened. Three declarations, I don't even know you. Three declarations, I love you. Buddy, that's straight up inner healing. Don't think it's a a coincidence that he denied him three times and Jesus asked him three times because any number could have been used. But every curse he spoke out, Jesus said, you need to get over that. So you're going to say out loud right here in front of me because in front of me last time, do you remember in the scripture it says he looked at Peter and Peter ran. 
And he looks him straight in the eye and says, do you love me? Say it. You do. He gave Peter that healing. I'm going to show you another one. A man named James. Most people have never seen this, and I didn't see it till years ago, and, and it just grabbed me when I saw it because I never really thought about what was going on. But in Mark chapter 3, Jesus has a family. He has brothers. And in Mark chapter 3, verse 20, it says, He, Jesus, came home. Everybody say home. And the crowd gathered again to such an extent that they couldn't even eat a meal. And when his own people... His own people, the Greek word, autospara, autospara, it means the ones closest to you. Remember, he came home and the ones closest to him, when they heard this, they went out to take custody of him for they were saying, he has lost his senses. He came home and the ones closest to him said, he's out of his mind. Do you know that Jesus' brothers did not even believe that he was the Messiah? If you look in John chapter 7, after these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because of the Jews that were seeking to kill him. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of Booths, was near. Therefore his brothers said to him, Leave here and go into Judea so that your disciples may also see your works which you're doing. For no one does anything in secret with he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. And I think most people don't realize that's a sarcastic comment. Because the, the emphasis in that scripture is actually when he says... Any, uh, no one does anything in secret when he seeks himself to be known publicly. They were saying to him, you're seeking public fame. How do I know that? Look at the next scripture. For not even his brothers were believing him. Now I want you to reread that scripture when it's coming from someone who doesn't believe in you. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be publicly known. If you do these things, go show yourself to the world. Because they weren't even believing in him. His own brothers did not believe he was the Messiah. And there's been jokes after jokes after jokes about what it would be like to grow up as a sibling to Jesus. With everything Jesus does right, why can't you be like your brother, okay? But I want to step you into another family issue. What happens if your brother's telling everybody he's the Messiah and you think he's crazy? What happens? At this point, they're fed up. Dude, if you want to be publicly known, go into Judea and do some miracles. That'd be great because we don't even believe you're the Messiah. You got a group of family members here saying, enough, enough with the Messiah talk. This is just crazy. And James is one of his brothers. And James is frustrated, doesn't believe he's the Messiah. And so he's in this place of thinking, my brother has lost his senses. He thinks he's the Messiah to come. And they crucified him. What do you do with that inside? What do you do when you've been mocking your brother? who thinks he's the Messiah, and they take him into Jerusalem and they crucify him. What kind of guilt, what kind of shame comes upon you? What do you think, even if you thought he was crazy, it was like, but I didn't want him to be killed for it. I wanted him to be restored to his mental health. But in the book of Corinthians, Paul is talking to the church, and he says, you need to know what happened after Jesus was resurrected. You need the proof that he was resurrected. You need to know that there were people that he went and saw, and they can attest and prove to you that he was alive after that crucifixion and burial. It's in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, For I delivered to you as first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scripture, and that he appeared to Cephas and then one of the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at the time, most who remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Look, then he appeared to James. Then to all the apostles. And last of all, to one as untimely born, he appeared to me. I want you to think about that moment. 
I thought my brother was crazy and they crucified him. And I thought all this Messiah talk was finally done. I feel horrible that I treated him that way and he was crucified. But when he returns, the scripture tells us Jesus went to see James. Why? Why do we have to know that James? Look at all the other people. There's no other apostles except for Peter mentioned and Paul referencing himself. Everybody else is a group, but there's this one guy that stands alone. Jesus made a point to go see James. Why? Because he had to sit down and say, bro, in the words of Massey. I really am the Messiah. You really can believe. I know you put up with all that Messiah talk. I know that people told you I was crazy. But I had to come here to show you it's really me. What does that do to James on the inside? I bet he's remembering every single story about Jesus. Everything he saw happen and said, that was real. That was real. This guy really, I was the brother of the Messiah. He appears to James to heal James. James goes on to be a leader in the church in Jerusalem. He is so sold out now after that healing has taken place that he becomes a leader in the church. You notice Jesus didn't say, hey, James, get over the way you felt. He said, it's me. I'm taking the time after my resurrection, before my ascension. I only have a short time, but I'm going to come and see you because I want you to be healed from what you had to go through. Listen to me. When we come to Christ, we are definitely a new creation. But for some of us, your dad, your mom, they abandoned you. The man next door, your uncle, did something awful to you. Your first spouse crushed you. That job failure you had, it still haunts you. That financial crash or that poverty you went through still grabs you and pulls you in and says, you're not worthy of an income. That alcohol in your home still brings you night terrors and you're still waking up from it. Some of us are angry and we don't even know why. It just strikes and you bark and you wonder why in the world did I get so angry at that moment? Some of us feel like everybody's against me. Nobody's ever been for me. I got Jesus and eternity is great with Jesus, but the truth is none of you like me. Why? Because something hit you, it hurt you, it dug deep in you, and it festered in your soul. And you began building off of that festering. This is who I am. This is what I believe. This is how I have to treat people. This is how I have to walk. Because this thing is an anchor in my life, and I can't let it go, and I don't know what to do with it. And I came to Christ. Why isn't it gone? Why isn't my memory gone? Because Jesus came to bear your griefs and your sorrow because he wants to take it on himself. And unfortunately, some of us are holding on to it because we need it. I need to be angry about that because if I stop being angry about it, then it's like it's okay that the person did it. So I'm just going to stay mad about it and I'm going to carry that weight. And Jesus is saying, I took that weight at the cross. Give that thing to me. And you're saying, well, how does this process work when with this healing prayer? What do we do? How how, how do we give it up? Listen, here's one thing that I know when we started this process of using this in this church that we agreed we would never do. We will never guide you to your pain. I'll never ask you, did this ever happen to you? I'll never go to you and say, well, it sounds like maybe this. So let's pretend that happened. That's where it gets its bad market. See, because you'll find out when you go through this process, all we're doing is saying, here's your response to the problem. Your response is anger. Your response is unworthiness. Your response is guilt. If that's your response, I want to get you in front of Jesus. And I want to say, Jesus, why do they feel this way? I don't know why. He's going to have to tell you why. Because you know why? I could look at the obvious. And I could say, well, you've been married three times. I'm sure you're emotionally hurt. 
But the reality is it happened when you were seven years old and your dad said you would never be a good woman. And that has to be healed so that you can believe you can walk forward as a good woman. This is what this process does. It's like David saying, I know my sin and iniquity and I need some wisdom here. I need you to clean this up. I need you to do something about it because I don't even know what to do. As a matter of fact, scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. And that includes truth about you. Stand to your feet, please. I'm going to ask my prayer ministers to come forward. Jesus offers you healing in your emotions. I need my prayer ministers up here, please. He offers you healing in your emotions. And listen to me. For some of you, it's just getting a word of truth. Getting a word of truth. Getting a word of truth. Let me give you a word of truth. I struggled with my own mother for years. In my 20s, I was angry at her. I was angry at her because I felt like she would never step up and just make a decision. She was always a victim, and it drove me absolutely crazy. I couldn't even be around her because I just don't want to hear how you need me or you need somebody and you can't deal with things yourself. It was the burden I was carrying because of what she was struggling with. In the middle of a process in Spokane, Washington, the Lord said to me, you have no idea what she's been through. And if you knew what she would have been through, you'd be happy that she was as functional as she is. I didn't find out. I didn't find out till later that her father left her and wrote her the nastiest note. Crushed her. Crushed her because her own father said, I have no faith in you at all. There are places in you that Jesus can heal. He can step in and say, let her go. I've got her. You don't have to carry this one. I'll give her healing. You'll be okay, Todd. Move on. For some, it takes a word. There was a person in here Wednesday night who had been hurt by previous pastors. And as I walked through a crowd of people who were asking for prayer, all I did was lay my hand on her and say, Spirit healer. And she came to me afterwards and said, The Spirit told me that you will not hurt me like they hurt me. And when it's happened, that set me free from the pain of those past pastors. Wow, can we just get real? There's a reason you're struggling with that. And when Jesus steps in and says, no, I was there. This is what really happened. No, you didn't know this. But now that I'm going to tell you this, it's going to set you free from carrying that. That's why we do it. I see so many people. There's a man standing right there who was in an inner healing session. And when he got broken from the emotional issue, the physical healing came. Come on. Father God, we're in this house this morning because we are saved children of a loving God, new creations in Christ. But I got wounds, and some of them, God, I just need you to cleanse my heart, purify me with hyssop, come and take this away. Show me where you were. Show me what I needed to know, what I didn't know. Show me the lie that I believed based on what they said to me. It was never the truth, but I took it as truth. And when you tell me why they said it, I can be set free that it was never the truth about me. I thank you, Jesus, that you bore our griefs, that you carried our sorrows on the cross. And you're ready to set us free. We love you in Jesus' name. If you're here today and you just want someone to pray with you, that's what these people do. They've gone through 19 hours of training to be able to just speak into your life. 
If you need inner healing, listen to me. There's a Saturday, every third Saturday, you can meet with a counselor who's been trained to get you in front of the Holy Spirit. There's a six-week class coming up. There is Chemo and Natalie who are regular at this church that can meet with you one-on-one. Don't let that burden go on. Let it go. You'll be amazed at the joy you can find once you get it released. I bless you today, and I bless you to be healed in your soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you for joining us today. I hope the word today has been impactful. I hope it's been meaningful. I hope there was something said today that struck you in your spirit, that you could ask the Holy Spirit to give you revelation on how you can use that in your life today. We thank you so much for joining us. We'd love to have you join us in the actual services at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. on Sunday morning at 851 Johnson Avenue in Stewart, Florida. And if you'd like more information about Revive Church, check out our website. It's reviveusnow.com. God bless. Have a great day.